the Mill Festival of Creative Technology, very exciting. Um, our session, we're gonna be talking about uh, the convergence of technology and art, art and technology, which is obviously something which we have got implicit in a lot of the work that we do uh, here at the Mill, but we're gonna be talking about it, I think, in a bit more specific terms. And I'm delighted uh, to be joined for this session by uh, BT Wolf and Will McNeil. Um, BT, I'm going to um, do a quick introduction for you, if uh, if that's acceptable. Um, you've been described as a musical weirdo and visionary. I hope that's uh, still uh, still acceptable to use. Um, and an artist, a singer songwriter. I mean, you've got more uh, world first, I think, than is um, decent. Um, but you know, you've beamed your music into space. You're a UN woman role model uh, for innovation. Uh, you've held a uh, exhibition at the Victorian Albert Museum in London. Uh, you pioneer new formats for music and visual uh, art uh, alongside one another. Um, you are uh, you've you've you, you've created a wearable record jacket, uh, an anti-stream from the quietest room on earth. I mean, just bizarre and amazing uh, art projects that 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 we'd love to hear a bit more about in the in the um, in the in the course of our discussion and obviously a lot of those are often um driven by tech and um you know ha has led to a lot of um renowned publications kind of uh fating you for your innovative thought and, and vision um so we'll touch on those uh in in a moment but we're obviously kind of um very happy to be a collaborator with you not least of all on uh the uh, recent project from green to red again we will touch on that but i just uh, will finish the introduction there and let you say hello yeah well thanks dan it's wonderful to be part of this and um yeah i mean your your introduction sounded very serious you know i was like well <laughs> um but i think that um you know my work ultimately is is really about reimagining um, sort of tangible formats for the digital age and just figuring out ways that you know you can bridge the physical and digital and take the best of the old um, and combine it with the best of the new and I I feel like you know art is so valuable to us as human beings it's kind of core to our humanity as is nature um, and technology you know fast-tracked a lot of human experiences without necessarily reflecting the true value. So it's sort of ironic in some ways that I use technology to reintroduce a more traditional experience around music and art, which I felt kind of got lost along the way. Um, and, and I guess that, you know, the outputs are all very different. You mentioned the, the record jacket and the anti-stream and obviously our uh, collaboration, you know, this environmental timeline of the planet of 800,000 years of historic data so all the projects sort of come out very differently, but they all have this sort of central intention of just how to remind people of, you know, the magic of art um, and almost use technology as a facilitator for that greater narrative message experience, um, but not have technology lead any particular project. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, thank you, uh, Peter. And I think, you know, th those notions of kind of um, humanity and emotion and, and bringing those into into art is a really nice segue to um, to my other guest. I say my guest, it's not my guest. It's, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to claim it. But uh, Will McNeil, who is our design director at our London studio, a filmmaker and artist within the mill, um, as well as outside. Uh, I mean, for the, for the mill, he lends his talents to the full range of um, of products and services and, and kind of visual arts that we create at the mill, TV commercials, games, interactive motion design. Um, and outside will you dabble uh, frequently? Uh, dabble is probably a, the wrong uh, the wrong term, but you, you, you kind of create art in the intersection between art and technology and experiment with with digital tools that, that kind of facilitate and shape that artistic uh, process. You know, obviously you, you speak at design conferences and festivals around the globe, you've got a, um, 
a portfolio of work to your name, which is uh, which is wonderful and and, and varied, and, and we're really excited to have you uh, join in this talk uh, today. Do you want to say a little bit about uh, your role at the mill and and you know your interests outside? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so yeah, I work in the mill in the design department in our London office, and um, my role as uh, design director is is largely about trying to um, kind of bridge the gap between art and technology. Um, to help our clients understand like, what tools we have that we can use to make their work look great. Um, but really, it's in a way, it's almost trying to um, simplify the technology for them or almost make the technology slightly invisible for them and um, create projects that are, you know, that are beautiful, whether they were made on a computer or whether they were shot on a camera or, or made by hand. But, you know, the point for us is just making them look amazing but whilst working in a you know, very technical design studio. Lovely. Well, thank you very much. And we're going to, I mean, with, with like both of you, we're going to delve into uh, into bits of uh, bits of that work. But BT, can I just before we uh, before we get into the, the work proper, that you uh, have got some uh, interesting and, and rather wonderful news about the from green to red uh, collaboration. So so maybe we should we should pause at this stage and we, we're going to uh, play the trailer. Uh, for that uh, piece of work, the collaboration, um, and then talk about it a little more, and then and then we'll finish the clip with an exciting announcement about where you're going to be uh, next showcasing it. Perfect. Outside the people like cars are still running, went inside it's safe to deny that it's coming. The TV's turned up, so the winds are just humming to the sound of the heat rising. We don't want to hear that the problem is us, so we live like we want in our own universe. Cause man thinks he's God in a devilish way. We're too proud to see what we won't even say. We don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know. No, we don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know. So take my hand, babe, and I'll walk you to school where you'll learn how to live. About a new set of rules Cause we played all our cards And none left for you Forgive us my dear Can't you see It's the truth that we don't wanna know Don't wanna know Don't wanna know Don't wanna know No we don't wanna know Don't wanna know Don't wanna know Don't wanna know So that was that was the trailer from uh, for the piece from green to, to red and, and as you said earlier it's a uh, it's a it's a protest piece really it uses it uses data uh, to to show the kind of um, well the ecological impact of CO2 emissions on the on the planet it's, it's super super powerful I know that we're hoping to show it at the um, London Design Biennale this uh, this summer you know pandemic uh, permitting and we're hoping to kind of bring some um, some piece of interaction into that into that artwork as well. Is it is it worth you just kind of talking about what the expanded ambition for that piece is? Because it started as a as a very kind of linear, you know, database simulation, and then you know you're really keen, I think, to to take it take it on. But firstly, do you want to explain as well the uh, the news that I referred to uh, just earlier about where that's going to be next uh, showcase? Yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, so much um, to share with that piece. Um, so yeah, I guess we started it. A year and a half ago or, or maybe even less time is such a bizarre experience right now and you know the intention really was to have data be presented in a way that people could relate to you know because I was sitting with the this JPL friend chief engineer and he was showing me these graphs of you know atmospheric co2 data 
And as soon as I saw it, you know, and you get this sense of like, oh my God, this is where we are. Um, but I also saw how cold that was. And it was sort of this feeling of how do you take something like that and make it be something emotive and something that anyone, even if they're watching 10 seconds or they just get one line about what the project is, they immediately get a sense of sort of where we are on the planet right now. Um, and so in that sense, it's, it's you know, as you saw, it's pretty um, effective. And it's taking this protest song that I wrote in 2006 after seeing An Inconvenient Truth, which I immediately thought I didn't need to record because, you know, everyone would see this film and we'd all be on a totally different path. Um, and so this kind of 15 year old song has been given this new, um, you know, new life in this project, which is, is sort of simultaneously a protest song, a reimagining of the music video format, and also this interactive timeline um, of, you know, of our planet and human impact on the planet. Um, and it's just been amazing, you know, working together on this and seeing the response, like even with that trailer, you know, when the Barbican commissioned a, a documentary about my work, we had the trailer playing in the Barbican gallery and, you know, people were already wanting to cover it, write about it. And it was, we'd literally just done that first iteration. So seeing how effective it was immediately um, was so incredibly encouraging. And, you know, where it's going to be next, obviously, the London Design Biennale in that full interactive version that we talked about. Um, but also at the Nobel Prize Summit in, in April, where I'm going to talk and perform um, and then show the, the trailer for this project. Uh, but for me, you know, it's interesting because the interactive aspect, it's sort of from and even from the beginning, in some ways, it, it, it was important, but also it wasn't because actually it was more about just presenting something and having it be something that, that people could actually absorb rather than it needing to have this sort of, oh, if you do X, you know, you get this much more from the piece. Um, we are going to have that. We've got a few really interesting layers that we're going to work in on the interact interactive side. But I think it's more just like um, a statement of where we are right now, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we, we, we've been talking, haven't we, about kind of, you know, recreating the piece in, in, in real time, uh, you know, using real time technology to allow that data to kind of have a bit more of a kind of uh, one to one response. And as you said, kind of, you know, people already respond to the beauty of the, uh, of the kind of imagery. Uh, and the lyrics, you know, tied together. And so within a gallery space, I suppose that kind of the, the differences in technology just allow us to think about that that audience engagement uh, in a different way. I wanted to kind of use that as well, like as a as a segue. By the way, I think my my invite to the Nobel uh, Prize summit got lost in the in the post somehow. It's, I thought I was up for the award this year, but uh, clearly not. Um, but yeah, that that kind of that use of of data to drive visualizations. Well, I know that like, you know, briefs that we get in the door, you know, we do a huge amount of kind of data art viz and, and um, you know, kind of manifest those in, in very different ways, but often it's quite a kind of baked in uh, linear piece. I think, you know, one of the one of the pieces that you that you led and worked on, um, the Lush Spa uh, experience is, is something which kind of uses data, uh, but in a, in a very kind of different way, I think. And I, and I think if we run the clip and just kind of show the, the case study behind that film so that people can see the visuals and then maybe you can you can talk about, you know, that different approach to data and that, the, the kind of biometric readings that, that went into the visuals for that. Is that okay?
So, Will, do you want to talk a little bit about what you um, what you were kind of aiming for with that piece, and then we'll 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 kind of um, you know talk a bit more about data in in art and and, and you know the different ways that it can manifest. Yeah. Yeah, that project was for Lush, uh, the cosmetics company, and um, you know they don't really like to do kind of traditional advertising, TV ads, for dads that you would know. They like to come up with something a little bit special. And this time, they had come up with a new treatment that they wanted to um, they wanted to market. Uh, and the treatment was all about kind of mixing senses and synesthesia. So you have you know, uh, there was sound, and there was uh, uh, smells, good experience. There was a um, uh, light therapy going on at the same time, and of course, a massage and all that. So they said, could you come up with a way to show what that would feel like? And our creative director, Carl Addy, uh, came up with the idea that we would literally show what it felt like. So we stuck sensors over people while they're having massages. Uh, one of our technicians sat in the, a spa treatment room while it was going on for seven days, came out smelling amazing. And, um, and, uh, and we got all this, these numbers off of people. You know, their brain waves, heartbeat, um, breath. And also one that was really interesting was um, the sensor that you put on someone when they're having a polygraph, which can measure skin conductivity. It's basically how much you sweat. Uh, we figured out a way to kind of repurpose that so we would measure how much the person was being touched and how hard by the masseuse. And um, we took all those numbers and we sort of set them to one side and then we thought, okay, well, that's that's going to drive our animation, and drive our system. But what's actually the stuff going to look like? And you know, how are we going to create, as the BT's piece, kind of a visceral response, not just a bunch of numbers going across the screen? So we spent a while you know, developing these different setups that would look at, you know, if you wanted to suggest what a massage would look like, we created this kind of thing that my daughter calls a toothpaste crown, which is a sort of sculpture that's constantly leading and twisting to represent touch. And then we plugged the numbers into them and saw basically how that would drive that animation and what would happen. And I think you know the really most satisfying part was we've been doing a lot of it in front of just test numbers that we've invented, but when you actually plug the data into it, and it, it became this kind of weird hybrid of, of something that was made by an animator and a designer like me, but also driven by real world information at the same time. And it, um, it really works, I think. It's one of my favorite pieces. And it kind of, for me, kind of, um, it started this fascination I have with making, designing something that then is going to get changed by some other input, somebody else playing with it, or its numbers coming in, or, or anything like that. Sure. And I think, uh, you know, that kind of makes me think of a lot of your work beats as well, because there's kind of, like a lot of the pieces, as far as my experience of them has, got, uh, has gone, it is um, they're driven by you know, more than one sense a lot of the time. Is that, is that fair? Like, whether multi-sensory in a kind of, you know, true sense of the word, but but they often kind of are trying to, um, I don't know, dis distort or, or play with the senses a little bit or kind of tap into, you know, different uh, different feelings or different ways of experiencing sound or vision or the combination of the two or touch. Is, is that fair? I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about the... Um, uh, about the, the 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 beaming of your song into space and, and and what kind of what prompted that and again we can we'll play a little clip just before we, we go into it but I'm kind of interested as well uh, when we when we come back and talk about it to just hear you know what what was the genesis of that but what was the thinking about the idea and then how did technology kind of help you to uh, you know to really kind of realize that ambition I guess so I believe it's raw space it's the uh, is the project, am I correct? Yeah, yeah, you are. So let, let's let's play a little bit and then we'll come back and kind of talk about how that came about. The place, a hilltop in New Jersey. The setting, giant antennas like monstrous eyes and ears, straining, watching, waiting. And now, 50 years on, this historic horn will be used for the first time to beam music into space. My latest record, Raw Space. Should we do it together? One, two, three. So here we are, we're in front of the Homdil horn antenna, um, which was used to prove the validity of the Big Bang Theory. Won the scientist Nobel Prize. 
What's so exciting about raw space is not only will we be creating the first fully augmented reality 360 album stream, but we'll also be the first to beam an album into space via this horn antenna. Today they are looking, as all humanity looks, to the vast potentials of outer space. <laughs> At first, I was perplexed how to do something like this, but as I thought about it, I started having ideas. We all know radio. If we could modulate the sound on a microwave carrier, it could go through the horn and go up into space. So what do we have here? It's a fancy radio that shows what we're transmitting. And if you look at the screen, there's this big spike. And that's the radio signal that's carrying your music. Hope we can listen. Here we are. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we turn the antenna up, that signal will be the one heading up into space. OK, well, should we do that now? Yes. Yes. Let's do it. <laughs> But, you know, it's amazing how when things are made well, they last. <laughs> Just like music, folks. So this is the end of the horn where we can connect to either a signal source or a receiver. Right now, we have a radiator in there that can radiate microwaves and a speaker, which can broadcast sound. It comes out of this horn up to the surface up there, which is a piece of a paraboloid, sort of like a little piece of the reflector of your flashlight or something. Then it makes it into a signal that's going pretty much in one direction into space. Well, maybe at this hour, it will go past the planet Venus on its way out of the solar system. I love creating worlds for each of my albums and sending this one into space makes it truly universal. Well, I guess it's time to start the broadcast. Okay. <laughs> Should we do it together? One, two, two three. three. Hello, this is BT Wolf, and this is the Raw Space yeah. <laughs> broadcast coming to you from the rawest recording space on the planet and uh, transmitting into the rawest space outside the planet. What an amazing, uh, what an amazing project! What a crazy idea, really. I mean, do you want to just talk briefly, Beta, about how the opportunity came about? But, but as I said before, you know how you really kind of, um, you know, needed to lean on technology, whether old or new, actually, to uh, to be able to kind of realise what it was that you were trying to do there. Absolutely, I think um, you know you talked about sensors and you talked about obviously. It's funny, I'd never really thought about that. Um, particularly, but of course it's, you know, visual, um, tangible, um, audible. And I think that for me, it was just, it's always been about that multi-layered, you know, th th these experiences which have so many layers and people can come in wherever they want. They can come in just on the music or they can have the whole deeper experience. Um, and I, I think I identified quite early on that there were these three things that actually made something go in deep, you know, in a way where it imprinted on you forever. So, you know, you grow up and you can always remember when you heard Abbey Road for the first time or, you know, where you were in your room when you were opening up that record. Um, and those three things are, are tangibility, ceremony and storytelling. And so that was so interconnected with music for me as a kid and growing up and finding the record collection that sort of inspired all of this and, and simultaneously writing songs very young that those were the three things that had kind of got dislodged when we moved from digital from physical to digital so my whole thinking all the time was how do you reintroduce storytelling tangibility and ceremony into um, the listening experience that you know the the digital music experience today so with raw space it was kind of the most um in some ways advanced um or or the closest version to how i felt as a kid opening up these vinyls and entering into the world of the album 
um, that whole thing of the lyrics kind of streaming out around you, the artwork coming to life, um, you being completely present and, you know, in this whole space. So raw space was actually called raw space, nothing to do with space. It was called raw space because of this anechoic chamber at Bell Labs that I ended up going into because I was there working on a different project. Um, and it's the room where Helen Keller experienced silence for the first time. You know, you can hear the blood rushing through your veins. They built foil microphones, discovered psychoacoustics. It's this an incredible historic, but ultimately sort of ceremonial listening space. And I just fell in love with this room and felt immediately like, okay, if I was gonna create an anti-stream, which I'd already been thinking about, this is the anti-echo chamber. So you would put the anti-stream in the anti-echo chamber. So, sorry, because this is probably a bit long, but raw space began as this, really this Fantasia experience for the album. You know, the first Live 360 AR experience with this record player playing 24 hours on repeat from the Anico chamber with people being able to log in. They couldn't shuffle, they couldn't interfere. But then using live AR, the lyrics would be streaming out of the vinyl, the artwork would be surrounding you and taking you into the visual landscape of each track as it was happening in real time. And the raw space sort of space broadcast, there was no plan. You know, like that was a complete random, wonderful event where I just heard about this, you know, um, Nobel laureate, Robert Wilson, who using that horn antenna had picked up cosmic microwave radiation and that then val validated the theory of the Big Bang. He was an ex, you know, uh, Bell Labs um, sort of scientist, astronomer, and he knew about the work I was doing. And so we decided to meet in front of this horn antenna. And I just said to him, look, you've used this to receive, but have you ever used it to transmit? And he was like, well, no. And I was like, well, I have this album called Raw Space. What if we sent it into space using the horn antenna? And he's like, well, no, because the sound waves will get to a point in the Earth's atmosphere and then stop. And I kind of thought that was the end of the conversation. And a month later, he comes back and he's like, hey, I figured out a way of doing an update on the horn if you still want to do it. And this is a National Historic Landmark. So, yeah, you know, two and a half, three years ago, he and I did this space broadcast of the record using this historic instrument. Um, and it was just wonderful. And it wasn't done for any reason. It was but it was done because why not? You know, he was excited. I was excited. Um, and the music of raw space is now traveling through space somewhere. So. So, so did he did he modify it to the degree that it would that it did become endless, as in when you when you blasted it into space, he'd, he'd overcome the problem of it, you know, bouncing back off the atmosphere. Yeah, because he he, com it, he converted it into a microwave signal, which essentially goes on, you know, forever. Um, so yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. So 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 accidental, but kind of obviously like driven by technology, but also, you know, a kind of weird combination of, um, you know, quite old tech, but doing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the technology that the thing you said about technology, the raw space, like, uh, you know, it was so advanced, like trying to even blend live AR with 4K video at that point, it, you know, nothing like that had been done. And it looked like we weren't even going to be able to do it. And then actually Eric Schmidt had seen a description of the project that I sent Bell Labs, uh, sent the president of Bell Labs. And he was like, this sounds amazing. We want to support so YouTube actually had to pull them their compatibility forward to be able to host raw space so it really was completely cutting edge um, and you know but my whole thing is that actually if no one realizes how you know how techy it is then that's the goal for me because it shouldn't feel like that it should just feel you know inclusive and immediate and accessible and you know, the fact that there's this sort of other aspect that is like, oh, I've not seen anything like that before, which is, you know, the, the sort of invisible tech touch that, you know, Will was talking about as well. Like, that's kind of the goal. It's not about like, hey, look what we've done. Aren't we clever? Um, it should feel very old school. It should feel very nostalgic. And I think that's a thing that connects all of my work is actually it does feel very familiar, but also like something different, I guess. 
Yeah, sure. And I think, I mean, that's interesting. Like, I'm interested in, both, in, in what both of you kind of feel because you both respond to, you know, creative ideas, creative briefs, sometimes, you know, creative ideas that you're having yourself, sometimes that you're shaping kind of for, for other people. Like, at what point, like, is there a kind of formula at what point the kind of the thinking about the technology that's going to help facilitate that comes to mind? I mean, I know, Will, like when we've spoken about it, you you talk about the kind of, you know, tech tools that you have as your, uh, at your disposal as a, as a kind of CG artist, as a design director working across a lot of software. That's, they've given you the kind of ability, if you like, to kind of uh, visualize and then produce some of the artwork that you, you you kind of have in your in your head. Like it, I don't know if there's a question wrapped up in that, but I'm kind of interested in what BT was just saying about the tech being invisible but being a facilitator at the same time. Yeah, I think I think there's a there's a problem in our industry of people finding creative briefs to match the tech they've invented, rather than going, okay, I've I've got a creative person who wants to tell a story, and we find the tech that suits it, and that's the better way of going about it, uh, I think. Um, so, you know, in our case, that's something we have to grapple with a lot, uh, you know, as people trying to figure out, you know, is there really a, a, is there a solution here within the bounds of this project that we have that can make, can make this happen? And yeah, make, make the tech kind of disappear. Um, I mean, I can give an example of something recently where we, we used 5G to remotely give someone a tattoo. So, uh, in a way, that was uh, using technology to, or you know, pe as a piece about technology. But actually, it becomes a human story in the end. It becomes about you know this person who's willing to have their arm tattooed by a robot that's being controlled over a, a digital signal. And um, you know, if you watch the behind the scenes of that, you, know, you get that impression quite quickly. And I think that's the case with all this stuff. It only really resonates with people if there's a human story there. And you know, for me, whilst I use tech a lot, in fact, I couldn't really have a career without it, um, it's often the case that I'm actually trying to kind of hide the fact that I did that, or, or at least make that stuff, you know, really in integral to the story that I'm trying to tell, so that it's not just kind of tacked on there as a bit of gloss. Yeah, uh, yeah. The tattoo, the tattoo project, the impossible tattoo, is uh, called with, uh, with Team O One uh, over five G. Uh, it could have been. It, it was a, a human story. It could have been a human tragedy. You know, <laughs> it could have been a, a disaster on many levels. Yeah, yeah it could have been. But um, yeah, that's a, that's an amazing project. And uh, and you're right. Like at, at the heart of it. And to go back to what we were saying at the beginning, and, and BT when you were describing, you know, that what you're aiming for with from from green to red. You know, uh, um, it's really about the the human response, right? So it's and and a human response is often driven by emotion. You know, in one way or another. Um, whether conscious or unconscious. So, um, so yeah. Again, I'd kind of flip that that question to you as well, BT. In terms of like when you are working on a project, I mean, can you talk a little bit about your process? And because technology is often in, in it, you know, kind of very very present in what you're doing. And, and I understand what you were saying before that it's, you know, it, you try to make sure that that isn't the story or the driver to to the idea. But I wonder, you know, is it serendipity uh, that often drives the kind of tech angle to it. Is it very specific? Like, can you talk a bit about how how some of those collaborations or, or, or the kind of really tech advanced projects that you've done um, kind of come about? Sure. Um, I mean, I think um, just that, that something I've always uh, sort of thought is, you know, art humanizes technology and technology can facilitate art. And when you have it sort of that way around, um, and you always know why. I think if you if you don't know why at any point, you know, if someone's like, oh, okay, so why is the music being woven into a fabric? Um, if you can't answer that, then you shouldn't be doing it. And and you really, really have to know why you're pulling in each layer. Um, and then tech just becomes another layer. You know, it's just another layer on top of, I don't know, history or space or science or health or art uh, design these are all just layers it's just you know within your toolbox like well what's the most effective way of telling that story as will talked about 
in a fashion that feels so integrated. It's so integrated, you can't separate out the parts, you know? Um, and so in that way, it's like each project is very, it's, it's funny because serendipity is a huge part. And there's also this kind of abstract nature, even when talking about it, that it's never one line, you know, it's never like this linear experience. Um, but simultaneously, there's this kind of energy that's driving it, you know, all the time that you just have to keep on. OK, does this feel right? No. OK, does you know, is that component interesting? No. Or yes. Um, and it's more, I think, about just trusting um yourself and what make you know because obviously i think a big issue is that you can start having like oh with raw space as an example um there was a desire at some point or one of the engineers was suggesting we should have an ambisonic aspect to it and i was just thinking that's a that's great and we could and there's reason for doing it but will it distract from that ultimate feeling or experience that i wanted to create and and it felt like it would um, so I think, you know, I found with every project also, I, this is probably all <laughs> like little bits of information, but I found that every project is kind of a detour. It's never been what I thought I was going to be working on at that point. You know, it's always kind of come from left field in terms of I've always got this thing in my mind of, you know, how do you reimagine a vinyl experience for today? That's sort of the central thing that I'm thinking about all the time. Or how do you make, you know, art more, I don't know, just remind people of the magic of art today. Um, but then that it's never like, OK, now I'm going to make a musical jacket or now I'm going to make a 3D theatre for the palm of the hand or an anti-stream or or you know the the timeline interactive um environmental timeline it's that you have that intention and then you go into a space that inspires you or you hear about an invention that kind of piques your curiosity or you realize that you know there's um a way of presenting something that hasn't been presented before and from there, it's like you kind of start just building a, within that, you know, area. And then, but it's really, it's really narrative driven. It's like, what is the main intention that this project is trying to realize? You know, what is, what is it trying to say or what is it trying to do? And then just being completely true to what it is that it needs to realize that. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if that is answered no, anything. <laughs> the creativity, right? I mean, you, you started as describing it as like a, a technology or kind of weaning your way through this different tech, but actually that's nothing different from the way artists have always found, you know, they switch between media or they, they you know, try something really complex and then they stripped it down and then they tried all these different things to tell their story in the best possible way. I mean, that, and and that's the essence of creativity, you know, uh, successes, failures, you know, uh, dead ends, turns that take you off somewhere new. And I don't think any of that's, any of that's really changed just because we're doing it digitally. It's just, you know, it's always been there. And it's, you know, any great invention is always somehow a, a little bit of goodwill and a little bit of serendipity. Yeah. And actually, on that, just on that point, I think that so much of it is driven by the fact that music and art have become so intangible and so valueless. You know, when we move from physical to digital, music and art lost all, really all of its value in the sense of like, you know, we, we suddenly had access, but we didn't have value in the same way. We had noise, but we didn't have curation. And art music became part of that background noise along with, you know, notifications and news and calendar alerts, all this stuff that's kind of floating around in this intangible sphere and and coming in at the same frequency so that we're sort of fatigued with all of it. So I think that that idea of actually bl blending music with with technology, but with other fields, you know, with the other fields I mentioned, it's like, how do you get the richest human experience from whatever it is you're doing? Um, because 
we're now in a, in a time where the mediums that we love have got reduced and compressed in a lot of ways. So you kind of have to start blending things more. Um, and I think there's a, there's a great potential from, from blending fields that you, traditionally were siloed, you know, where we were either mathematicians or we were artists. Truly great works are kind of touching on a lot of different fields simultaneously. And that's, I guess, where I, where I like to uh, explore. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, and I guess, you know, or, or a question that sort of came to me as, as both of you were talking was how, like how lightly or kind of seriously or, uh, you, you know, resentfully, if that's the word, uh, you wear the kind of labels that you have attached to what you do as artists that are kind of rooted in the, in the, in the technology space. I mean, with, with you, BT, like I was, kind of, you know, your work, your art kind of spans so many different uh, sort of disciplines and mediums and, and, and just expressions, really. But of course, you do have this, um, you know, part of your, your reputation or the way that people describe you is, you know, as, as a kind of innovator, as, as, as you know, a, a kind of visionary within the, the tech space. And, and Will, you know, you, you know, your title for the mill, certainly is CG design director, you know, you opposite, uh, it, you have an element of kind of, you know, computers and technology like built into the to, to the work that you do. And I know that that kind of leans across into your work as a visual artist. So I kind of, I'm just interested in, in, yeah, how you wear those labels and, and whether you think that they're important or um, kind of irrelevant really in, into how people should see you and, and the work that you do. I'll start with you, Will. Uh, I mean, I think one of the funniest things that happens in the middle all the time is when we're meeting someone new or a client, uh, someone who knows me well will, will say, what exactly do you do? And it's just, you know, it's very difficult to pin this stuff down. It constantly changes. Um, and I think, you know, the, 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 the job titles that we gather are you know, kind of meaningless because what was, uh, you know, a design director uh, two years ago is probably a, a different role now. Um, I think as long as we, you know, we cling to the essence of what it is that we do, which is that we kind of you know, enable stories to be told, or we tell our own stories, and we do it you know, as creatively as possible, that's cool. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, this, this term sort of creative technologist is is one that um, you know, I think is really exciting, but also at the same time, um, is there really such? Was there ever a time where there wasn't? People doing this, you know, where there were people doing this, you know, are all artists all kind of creative technologists anyway? Yes, if that's a rhetorical question uh, <laughs> or even a direct question, I would say yes, they are, or I would also leave it floating. What about you, Beta? I mean, you, you, um, yeah, the, these kind of labels or epithets that get applied to you and your work, like, do you, do you have a view on them, or, or is it something which you just think is is relatively irrelevant because you're going to be doing the work that you're doing regardless? Yeah, I think I guess I um, I don't really think about them until I have to think about them. You know, when you're then giving a talk or something, and then you've got to say who you are, which I find so awkward because it's just like, you know, you don't. I don't know. It's just a bizarre thing. Of, I've I've always seen myself as BT, so I can say I'm BT. But beyond that, um, there's not much more beyond that because um, I think those boxes and labels they're always in any form, in any part, walk of life, like they're always limiting factors um, and, they're, and they're often kind of misleading. Um, and then we start identifying with them, which is also doesn't really help. So yeah, I tend not to really think about that particularly. Um, I, I, I do like the fact that being a, a tech innovator or whatever, when I then sometimes encounter a, you know, a forum or a discussion where they think I'm going to be like, yeah, technology, AI, you know, all these things that actually I have a lot of uh, conflicting opinions about. Um, and then the, in some ways I can, I can straddle that position of obviously using technology um, in all of my projects as a way of kind of getting this, this uh, added dimension but equally knowing where technology is, um, can kind of erase our humanity, you know, whether that's auto tuning, airbrushing, all of that stuff that we can now do to actually get all of the humanness out of art, which is why it connected to begin with. The imperfections are why something connects. 
so we I feel like we cannot lose that aspect and if anything it's made me even more aware of that um, and also just the fact that technology has amplified you know the dysfunctionality of of our ego you know you see what's been happening politically um, environmentally everything that's going on so much of that is down to technology in a myriad of different ways for the, the for the various things that it does uh, which aren't really for the greater good so I kind of like having that title in some ways only because then I can offer you know I can offer two sides to that discussion I think rather than just being like um, what maybe people expect you know I would I would say yeah that, that makes a lot of sense it, it allows you to kind of challenge from within um, perceptions a little bit and therefore kind of start um, start conversations I mean I think um, we're kind of getting close to the end of time and um, I do think you know one of the best introductions to your work BT definitely is and I, I think I'm going to get the title wrong but Orange Juice for the Years am I correct the documentary about uh, your work which we were lucky enough to to go to a premiere of before pre-COVID uh, but, but a wonderful kind of film um, that uh, you know, really kind of speaks to, to, you know, the plethora of your work and, and kind of who you are as an artist, I think, really well. I love to create tangible formats for my albums. When I was about seven or eight, I discovered my parents' record collection. I just saw opening these records up as kind of like entering into the worlds of these albums, and that was the gateway into this world. I just couldn't accept that my albums wouldn't have these worlds. Instead, they would just be these kind of intangible experiences floating around somewhere. And so I was just determined to create a tangible album but for this digital age. Um, but I also wanted to just give you an opportunity to talk about, you know, something which is less kind of art based, but just to, to give a plug because I think it's important and it's driven by technology in, in different ways that the, the work you do for dementia patients and, and just kind of, you know, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that project and, and so we can kind of wrap up with a, uh, you know, a bit of a kind of promotion of, of, of what's going on there. Absolutely. I mean, the Orange Juice for the Years, that the title of that film, which was a documentary about my work, um, it directly connects to the Dementia Project for that line because um, Orange Juice for the Years was a, a line from Oliver Sacks about neurologist Oliver Sacks about the power of music and how deep it really goes. And I ended up doing a music dementia research project, um, which I began in 2014 and then ended up um, attracting a lot of attention from Stanford and various, you know, some of the top neuroscientists and researchers. Um, because it was looking at, for the first time, it was looking at music that wasn't familiar um, for people living with dementia and Alzheimer's. Because typically, they knew that if you, you know, if you played a, a familiar song, it w it could sort of trigger a memory and bring someone back. But no one had e ever tested music for music's sake, so music not connected with memory. Um, and that's what this research project did. And the the results and the um, oh, the the moments were just incredible. You know, I saw people who were um, catatonic getting up and, and dancing. I saw people who were nonverbal singing along with songs they'd never heard. And it really reaffirmed everything I believed about music and art, which is how deep it goes. And we, we actually don't even realize how deep it, it goes. Um, and so, it kind of then strengthened that resolve on everything else that I was doing to have that be such a central message to the to every project um, because art really is core to our humanity you know Oliver Sacks said there are two things that keep us alive as human beings um, nature and art so I just feel like anything you know anything I do that's in service of either of those two things with with um, you know from green to red working with you guys um, it's that project is in service of both of those things so that's just perfect for me um, but that's what it's kind of all about I think I'm not going to be able to top that quote am I? so I will uh, I will kind of wrap up I feel like we touched on a whole load of things that we could have rambled on about for, for, for a long time um, but I'm really grateful for 
for those insights and and you know and, and your time and, and kind of you know coming together to just talk about this topic which is wide ranging but um uh, but super interesting so thanks for for sharing your time and your insights and, and your projects and we'll uh, we'll point to is, is information about that dementia project on your um uh on your website BT. can we point to that it is, yeah, and actually it ended up founding a charity. So there's now a charity called Music for Dementia um, 2020, which is actively getting music in all care homes in the UK. Wonderful. Okay, so we'll make sure that we, we plug that. And also, uh, Will, your adventures in, in, in art and technology and, and even you know original pieces of art uh, are on your personal uh, portfolio site as well. So we'll make sure that we kind of link out to that as well. Um, and yeah, it's lovely to see you both um keep well and thank you again for your time and we'll um uh, we'll wrap things up thank you so much